the 19th meeting of the committee is hereby resumed. Good evening and welcome, Mr. Prime Minister. Chairman, good afternoon to you, members, colleagues. This is an inquiry into the Trail and Tobago Inter-Island Ferry Service with specific focus on the procurement and maintenance of the ferries. The objectives of the inquiry are to understand the current state of the ferry service in Trail and Tobago, to examine the policies and procedures used to acquire ferries, and to ensure that value for money is obtained, to determine whether due diligence governed the conduct of all aspects of the maintenance and management of the provision of the Seabird Service and to determine the changes and challenges with respect to the maintenance of ferries. In this regard, before we begin, may I introduce myself? My name is Stephen Kreese. I'm the chairman of this committee. And on my left. Thank you, Chairman. Daryl Smith, member. Good evening, Honorable Prime Minister. Wade Mark, member. Good evening and welcome to my Prime Minister, Glenda Jennings-Smith, member. And good evening and welcome, Nigel Freitas, member. Good evening, Laval Francis, member. Good afternoon, Franklin Khan, member. Good evening, Prime Minister, Rashtan Pari, Vice Chairman. The witnesses advise that your testimony is covered by parliamentary privilege. Before the questions begin, do you wish to make any opening statement? Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity to make an opening statement. Let me begin by uh, indicating that I am here in my capacity as head of the cabinet, but also as a colleague of those assembled around the table, because I regard myself here this evening as talking to the parliament's committee. And I'm glad for the opportunity to make an opening statement because I, my presence here is purely in the context of the, uh, the, the terms of reference of the committee, which is the procurement and maintenance of the ferries, and by extension, the ferry operations of the port. And I, as head of the government, as soon as I saw that there was an interest in convening this committee, I indicated that the government would cooperate fully with uh, this event, this venture, and I consider it to be um, breaking of new ground with respect to the country's management and the use of the parliamentary committee in directing the operations of state. And that is why I was not hesitant to indicate that I'll be here when I saw that um, members indicated that my presence here might assist the committee. Chairman, I speak um, from the location of head of the government, chairman of the cabinet with responsibility for the country's affairs and vicarious responsibility for whatever happens anywhere in the government. And when I saw the invitation intended to be extended to me, I thought I, uh, what I saw was that it said that the committee wanted to find out why I made certain comments with respect to certain operations of the port. Namely, why is it that I made comments that I was, um, I had concerns about the operations, specific operations at the port. I made two comments in that regard. The first comment was made by me when there were issues with respect to the Galicia a vessel that was operating for some time between Trinidad and Tobago. And that vessel's principals and the ministry and the port got into, if we may call a bit of a kankatang, resulting in the vessel 
being withdrawn from service while it was contracted to the state. And that development resulted in me as member of the cabinet and head of the cabinet paying particular attention to what was going on there because I had a very clear view as to what this might mean for inter-island transport and particularly for the people of Tobago. And in so doing, I got myself familiar with the documentation that was uh, surrounding that vessel, its operations, and its incident. And at that time, I made a comment that I was concerned about what it represented. And so concerned was I that I asked the Attorney General to look at the documents and advise me as to whether, in fact, there were untoward happenings with respect to that arrangement. Later on, I went to Tobago, by which time the vessel had been withdrawn and Tobago people were feeling the negative effects of the withdrawal and the short-term stopgap measures were irritating people and so on. And I went to Tobago, I traveled on the ferry to Tobago. And before that, I went to Tobago and I met with some members of the business community and I indicated to them my, my concerns. And then I went to Tobago again and I met with them maybe the comprehensive body of business communities in Tobago. And at that, I had a press conference after I met with those people. And at the press conference, a member of the media put to me a question as to whether I was convinced that there was wrongdoing or corrupt practice with respect to the procurement exercise on the port. And um, I indicated, yes, I was. And that indication was based and the documentation that I had seen and that I was familiar with at the time. Uh, I want to make a general statement, Chairman, that from my familiarity of the operations of the port before I became Prime Minister, and even now as Prime Minister, I can conclude that the port is an area of darkness into which some severe lighting needs to be shown. The port is a very important area of the national economy. And I want to just confine myself a little bit to the ferry service between Trinidad and Tobago, which is also essential, an essential service. But what has happened over time is that certain practices, conflicts, irregularities, and I dare say indifference, has developed as a matter of course on the port and its operations. And out of that would come the need to rectify it. And in any rectification, there would be those who would want to vigorously defend the status quo, and in some instances, defending themselves. Because as bad as the situation is, it works very well for some people. The port spends a large amount of money in obtaining goods and particularly services. And that arrangement of public monies being spent to make these goods and services available have attracted a certain kind of behavior, a certain kind of uh, response, which is quite worrisome. And I have no doubt that there are those who are quite happy with what is going on in the port. As Prime Minister, I was, and I'm very unhappy about it, and I took st certain steps to address it. And some of those steps have caused certain kinds of reactions. But I will only confine myself to the documentation, because without the documents, we end up with a lot of what I saw here this afternoon. Um, I don't want to go down that road. I am going to confine my involvement in this matter to what the documents can support. Because if there's any rectification, and worse, if there's any accountability of persons to be held accountable at any stage, you can only do that. Not by who like who, or who say what, or who did know what, or who know who. It is by what can be supported, especially if it is likely to end up in a court of law. And it's against that background that I could say, Chairman, that when I became party to certain information, and I think I should go a little, for the, for the benefit of the public, because this, this thing has been 
exercising this country since, I think, April, since early, mid early April. The first set of documents I saw, which caused me to be concerned by the point I made earlier on, was that the port set about to obtain a vessel for Tobago in 2013. That vessel left here in 2016. What the documentation has shown is that there had been serious irregularities with respect to that procurement process. And I want to point out one specific irregularity which seemed to have been quite normal and accepted at the port and is defended now with great vigor. And the irregularity is this. We had a vessel on contract. I refer here to the warrior spirit. The warrior spirit was contracted for a period of time. One of its engines failed, and the port decided to replace the warrior spirit. But to do so, the port had to break the contract which held that vessel to the port services. The port hired a lawyer to provide legal help in treating with this problem, which had to be treated with because a one-engine vessel should have been of concern to the government of the day. So I take no issue with that. The documents will show that in its operations at the port, that exercise, that procurement exercise morphed into the attorney who was hired to give legal advice on this contract by port operations morphing in to an advisor as to how to replace the warrior spirit and morph into an arrangement where the lawyer became a searcher for a vessel. Five vessels were found. One particular vessel then became a vessel of interest and the lawyer became an advisor to the port as to which vessel should be chosen and then the lawyer became a supplier of that vessel by way of an agent. Now, as a procurement process, this is absolutely astounding. And this is a significant, significant contract of many tens of millions of dollars. Interestingly enough, what caught my attention when I perused those documents in the early part of paying attention to this development was when I saw that the evaluation process at the port did two things that were of concern to me. One was the invitation by the port's authority to invite the lawyer to be a supplier of this vessel in the scheme of things among brokers, the lawyer not being a broker. But more interestingly, when the evaluation process was undertaken, a vessel appeared that was not part of the process, and the document asked the question, why is this and how is this vessel in front of us? And the evaluation exercise was told, this vessel is the agent of the lawyer, and they proceeded to evaluate, just as simple as that. I saw no document where any question was asked. I simply saw that a vessel appeared belonging to the an agent supplied by the lawyer. Interestingly enough, that vessel won the contract and became the Galicia. In February 2014, 2014. I raise it in this detail because that kind of way of doing business continued right up until April 2016. That would have been under two governments, under three boards, but the bottom line is government come, government go, board come, board go, that arrangement survived and remained in place. So come January 2016, we are in the middle of a situation at the level of the cabinet where we are being told that the port has an issue to deal with, and that issue was to carry out for the fifth attempt, I think it was, to get a tender going on the port. 
because I think three or four times, the ports, operations, whatever it is, tried to go out for a tender. And on every occasion, that tender was aborted. And that caught my attention as to what is going on at the port where something that we have handled since the days of gelting and tasting and whatever, how come all of a sudden the, the port of Trinidad and Tobago can't execute a tender process to select a vessel? In fact, I went to the law, opening of the law term this morning, and the bishop mentioned in his synopsis of our country is that we can't buy a boat. But the exercise was there was a vessel in place that came in on a short-term tender. And the record will show that regardless of what was happening, there were three, four, five attempts to go out to tender at the end of a period of expiry, but for some reason the port couldn't get it done. The difficulty grew. The minister was changed, the board was changed in a, in a cabinet reshuffle, a general cabinet reshuffle, and a new minister went in place. And the next thing I know is that the government was facing a situation where the port was putting to the government that the arrangement for the continuation of the service of this vessel was that the vessel ought to be, the principles ought to be offered a five-year contract without tender, and I speak here of a contract worth almost approximately $300 million without tender, because up to that point, all extensions were without tender, all tender processes were frustrated, and this and other similar interests at the port had the effect of fracturing the board and dividing the management into camps as to who was for and who was against certain issues and certain decisions, and the documentation will show that the principles of the Galicia was taking the position that they are to get an extension without tender, failing which they will pull the vessel from service. I want to say here that this is a procurement process to which no government of Trinidad and Tobago should subscribe, and no government of Trinidad and Tobago should find itself in a situation where a supplier of a service or a good could tell the government that I am going to do this on these terms, failing which I will make trouble for you. So if you don't want trouble, you ignore any procurement process that could stand scrutiny and give me a quarter billion dollar contract and we continue merrily along the way. The government which I lead would in no way be so blackmailed and in no way would any minister in any government that I lead, find himself in a situation where he will succumb to that, regardless of who is advancing it, that a contract that has been extended without tender on more than one occasion, and four times you fail to get a tender going for reasons not, not yet clear to any person. And of course, a new government comes into office, and you indicate that you're going to tender, and the supplier will tell you, in the case of the Galicia, we want to buy the boat, and to buy the boat, you will give us a five-year contract to allow us to go to a bank, to raise money, to buy the boat, to be a supplier of service to you. But that might be good business for the Galicia interest. But what the documents will show, and by documents I make reference to the Mute report, which I commissioned for the simple reason that I wanted a document which would collate and accumulate all the documents surrounding this area of procurement and management at the port in recent times. So that that document being the compendium of authority of who did what, who say what, who have what, will be the, a compendium that could assist any investigation because I am sure that a proper investigation, a detailed investigation is required to get to the bottom of the problem at the port that I mentioned in my opening, at the beginning of my opening. So when one goes through the document, one thing is very clear in the documents that when the principles of the Galicia 
entered and accepted an 18-month contract in 2016 that was to expire in October 2017. Having done so by accepting the offer of that contract and operated that contract until April 2017, those principals were not in control of the Galicia. And they wrote to the Minister and the, the Minister of Works and to the Minister of Finance, indicating such that the vessel was only available up until February 2017. And for it to remain in service, an agreement had to be had for a five-year contract because the owners will call the boat out of service if a contract was not had where the boat could have been purchased by the Galicia owners, by the Galicia principals who had the boat on charter from the rail owner abroad. That is the condition of the situation in uh, early 2017. Now, this is a business venture being put to the government. As, as a matter of fact, it was put in the context of a public-private partnership with respect to the judging to accommodate the, accommodate the Galicia. But if you go to the documents, you would see the number of drawbacks and the number of situations where, from the very inception, where there were issues with that vessel. And for the government to accommodate it in perpetuity by those arrangements were not procurement processes that the government of Trinidad and Tobago could have entered into. When the vessel was pulled, in fact, if you may recall, in that attempt at blackmailing the government into accepting those terms, you may recall that Easter of 2017, it was made public that the vessel will cease to operate on Good Friday. Good Friday being the height of the entry to Tobago for the Easter season on which Tobagoans were depending for the largest bit of economic activity in Tobago. The vessel owners indicated publicly that the vessel will cease to operate on Good Friday. Certain interventions were made, and that didn't happen on Good Friday, but it happened in mid-April. In mid then we got to the point that as the vessel is leaving, the principals understood that they were contracted. And one of the conditions of the contract that was in place that if they had to replace the vessel, they will replace it by, with a vessel of a similar status and that vessel being present in Trinidad and Tobago. But by responding to their principles and pulling it out in mid-April, they offered the port, the documents will show, that they offered the port for the period of the unexpired part of the contract which they were operating, they offered an alternative vessel called Elizabeth Ross which the port found to be unsuitable and therefore could not accept it. And then the port made the point that if you are making any uh, change of vessel midstream to continue the contract, the vessel that is going to be the replacement vessel ought to be in Trinidad and Tobago so there'd be no break in the service. And what they were offering was a break of many weeks between the Galicia leaving and the other vessel being available. That is what the documentation has shown. And therefore, whether there's a contract in place and whatever, whatever, I'm not going to debate that here because I'm not a lawyer, I don't advise myself, but I will tell you that the state, whether at the port or the ministry, will ensure that the public's interest and the public right is pursued in the place where those things are discussed, and that is to come. That, that is to come. We've got two senior council advice, and both have confirmed the government's public position, and the government will proceed according to that advice. So that is one, and of course, with the limited notice and the breaking of the contract, the government had a, in front of it now a situation where expecting to have a contract ended in October, it was breached in, in April, and we had to get some kind of service to Tobago from the very next day. I heard a lot being said about the barge and the transport and so on. As Prime Minister, when this matter came to me, my, my instructions were, get the best that was available and get it now because Tobago has to be serviced from the next day. A very quick tender process was entered into. Only, I am advised that only one vessel, one, one person or one interest or one agent um, put a proposal in and that was found to be wholly unacceptable. So we got to a situation now where 
we had to deal with what, could, what, could, what we could find outside of the tender process, meaning treating with things in the unsolicited way. And you had to search. All that was available around the region and in Trinidad and Tobago at the time was the transporter and the barge. The barge to carry a certain kind of cargo and the transporter to carry a certain kind of cargo. It was the best that was available. If anything better was available in that period of emergency, the port, the board, and the government would have accepted that. Unacceptable, unacceptable as that was to some persons, and difficult as it was, we always maintained it was for a very temporary period. We had our hands in the lion mouth, and we entered into that contract for a three-month um, three period. That was the maximum, and we told the country, we told Tobagonians, we will try as quickly as possible to end that arrangement. I think it ended somewhere in the same kind of order, two to three months that we talked about. But during that period, a lot of inconvenience um, was extended to the people of Tobago, a lot of hardship. And in fact, I dare say losses were incurred because this is what developed out of what I just said. And at the same time, a new board was put in place in early April. And the new board was saddled with the responsibility of providing a replacement for this cargo ferry that had come to this grief and the government having the requirement to put something in place, if not temporary. We had a short-term arrangement, the very temporary arrangement. We had a medium-term arrangement to go to tender and get a better vessel for a one-year, two to three-year contract. And also, Cabinet took a decision that we'll take steps to begin the process of buying a new vessel. Of course, you know a vessel is not something you can buy in a supermarket or in a hardware or at Costco. You have to take some time in the gestation period to actually place the order, and then take some time to build it, and that's the long term. The medium term was to go out to tender and get a proper uh, vessel that doesn't have the kinds of problems that I've outlined, that I have not yet touched on the documentation of the problems that the Galicia had while it operated here. But of course, in the interim, the short term, was this very stopgap measure. And soon as we thought we had solved that, or we were in the process of solving that, another problem developed. On the passenger ferry side, where we were operating the Express and the Spirit, which provide, once they are running, they provide an adequate service to Tobago. A cargo vessel, two service vessels, and uh, the air bridge, we had a fairly adequate service. At peak time, we have to um, bolster it up and so on. But outside the peak time, the service is quite adequate. Then we discovered that the express had to be withdrawn from service as a matter of urgency, because it had not been serviced for quite some time, having missed its dry docking, and having been run up to a point where any further use was taking us to a point of questionable safety. So the express had, the spirit had to be pulled out of service. That left the express alone and left Tobago in a bit of a lurch in the event that the express breaks down, the service is gonna be a problem. We added a, a, a water taxi, which could have operated when the sea state was good. If the sea state was bad, that particular component couldn't operate. So we were again now limping along. So we got the perfect storm now of the, cargo side problem, now we have the ferry side problem, and the new board set about to fix both, which is to get a cargo vessel and to get a ferry vessel. And once both of these were in place, a good cargo vessel and a good ferry vessel, this problem after four or five months would have now uh, receded. Lo and behold, the board appeared to succeed and got a vessel called the Cabo Star, which to all intents and purposes, is providing a service and taking and a good service, and I think that there's a excess capacity and so on. There were some management and operational issues, which I think they're working out, but there is a cargo vessel on it. And of course, the next step was to get um, the, the, the ferry, a ferry boat that would um, replace the withdrawn express and the limping, the withdrawn spirit and the limping express, because the express has to go on dry dock itself and so on. I saw, Mr. Chairman, a lot of interest being placed in the procurement process of these two vessels. And I give you the assurance 
that I paid attention and the government paid attention to the media's work in raising questions about the procurement under the new board of these two vessels. Mr. Chairman, I must tell you, and I'm sure I should, I should I tell you just um, rhetorically or for the record, that in matters of this nature where there are benefits to be had and good contracts to be obtained, there's a, a, a response from persons who are not successful. And some persons behave very badly when they are unsuccessful. And some persons behave very badly in defending their interests. Don't expect that every person behaves in a very civil manner and say, okay, let the process work, and if I'm fortunate, I can tell you. It had been reported to me. That one individual turned up in the Ministry of Works and tells the minister, I'm a p and I have a boat, and I want that. And of course, the minister's position was, don't go so. If you have a boat, there's a tender out, put your tender out, put your, put your, put your bid in or put your offering in, the port will evaluate it, and if you are successful, matters not whether you're PNM or not, the boat will be successful. That might have made an enemy. But on the other hand, there were many other people who had offerings, and of course, um, they will advance it either in private or in public, and of course, we have a tremendously aggressive and, and, and I dare say competent press in Trinidad and Tobago. And if you know how to get your story in the media, you could really carry a case. And a lot of what has happened talking around that period and these items, a lot of it, not all of it, a lot of it had to do with interests um, peddling their wares. But then certain specific problems began to emerge out of the ether of examination. And we all know what the public was uh, made aware of. But something caught my attention, which caused me great concern. And it was this. Most of what was being said about the procurement outcome, process and outcome with respect to the vessel that was supposed to replace, the vessels that were supposed to replace the, um, the, the ones that I just mentioned that were withdrawn had to do with who has supplied the service, what process was used to identify and to select from these people, what we are paying for that service. And all of these are very valid questions. Make no mistake about it. These should and must always remain very valid questions. And in the event that those questions generate answers that cause concern, then the persons that have to provide those answers are to be held accountable. So that brings me to the point where I started, that the whole question of the procurement process and the procurement arrangements became the national conversation here for weeks around these vessels. As we were dealing with the crisis of the withdrawal, the sudden withdrawal of the Galicia, of the Galicia the government and myself as prime minister had a duty to do everything that was possible to accelerate the decision-making process. I made myself available as prime minister at any time of day to be consulted by the port through the minister. And if it requires a cabinet decision to fast track the process, I was quite prepared as prime minister to give that authority. And I did so on at least one occasion. Or it might, might have been two occasions where the instruction was given to proceed once the port was happy that they had found what they were looking for, gave the minister the instruction to proceed, because the way it goes is management to board, board to minister, minister to cabinet. Uh, but of course, I'm contacted on a Friday afternoon, and I'm told that the port had already found two vessels which they lost by not acting in a timely manner. And wanting to make sure a vessel get to Tobago as quickly as possible, we want to avoid that. So when they found the third vessel or thereabouts, and they said, listen, we have found a vessel. Everything is in place. I, as prime minister, could, would, and must, and did say, consult the attorney general with your findings. Once the attorney general's office clears it, and the attorney general is happy with it, I will give, you have my authority to proceed. The port can proceed through the minister, and the matter will be ratified by the cabinet. I take that responsibility for giving the instruction to proceed in the interest of time, and relieving the suffering in Tobago, and the matter comes to the cabinet. The alternative would have been 
We told that on Friday afternoon, so okay, bring it to cabinet on Thursday. That's a week we lost. Cabinet agrees to it on Thursday, and you may even want to wait for confirmation the following Thursday, so one or two weeks. What was happening in Tobago? As Prime Minister, I took the decision that I would make the decision and bind the cabinet to it, expecting the ratification. Of course, if I go to cabinet and my colleagues don't agree with me and don't ratify it, then I stand by that and the consequences I will face there. But that's how it goes. It's not uncommon for that to happen, whether it is with travel, whether it is um, obtaining in an emergency and so on. So that, for me, wasn't the issue. What really bothered me, Mr. Chairman, and got me very concerned, I was in Barbados on the weekend of the 11th of August. And I was just about to enter the, 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 the water outside of where I was staying, and I was contacted by a whistleblower who sought me out, identified me as the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, and asked me if I was aware that the vessel that is providing this, the cargo service to Tobago was owned by a Mexican entity called Baja Ferries. I was taking the conversation because this conversation was a, relating to a matter that I've just spoken to at length. I identified the person as a person of interest with knowledge in a matter of which I should be concerned. I said I was unaware that, um, what are you telling me? And I was told on the telephone that the Cabo Star was owned by a Mexican company called Baja Ferries. And that company, finding out that Trinidad and Tobago was in the market for a cargo vessel, had communicated with the port and offered that vessel to the port, owner to port, whether it is the ministry or to port board, the owner of the Cabo Star had made that offer of the vessel. Management. It was made to the port management. I said to the speaker that I will only entertain that allegation, which was to me, made against the background of a lot that was being said about the company that actually provided the boat. I said I will make that, I will take this information only if it can be supported by documents. I was returning to Trinidad on Monday and I indicated to the speaker that if you can support what you're telling me in documentary form from the so-called owners I will take this matter seriously. I returned to Trinidad on Monday night and met at my residence the following documents, which I would like to read into the record, because these documents are in the Mute report, along with all the other documents I made reference to in my summary. But I want to read two documents into the record here. Um, and I would. Since there are documents, I will, I will have to read the names of the individuals. The document is the dated, let me read one first. I'm reading here and well, I'm not sure which one comes first because they're both dated the same day. Okay, let me read, it. Let me read the letter first because the email is in late evening. The email is timed at 6.14 p.m. The email refers to the letter. So the email, so the email refers to the letter, so therefore the email is, is, is first. And the email is from a guy called Oscar Ruano. It was sent on Thursday, the 25th of May, 2017, at 6.14 p.m. to... Leong, L-E-O-N-G, at P-A-T-N-T dot com. That is the receiving address, and is copied to a, a number of other, and the subject is Baja Ferries MV Cabo Star, and it reads as follows. Dear Mr. Grant, 
hope this email finds you well. Mr. Brian Jones and Mrs. Mara Pedono, who are part of the marketing and business development team for our group, stressed out the importance of me getting directly in contact with you. Please find attached a self-explanatory letter in which you will find information of our MV Cabostar, which could be developed for charter and can be developed shortly. I am also attaching the certificate of registry and the record of equipment safety for the ship. We will send you some pictures shortly. Hope we can meet in the near future and my team and me remain at your disposal should you have any questions. Please do not hesitate to call any of us. That's an email coming from the owners of the Cabo Star who owned the Cabo Star in May, writing to the management of the port on the 25th of May, making the Cabo Star available owner to, to port. Subsequent, because this email refers to the letter, I draw the conclusion that the letter was written after the email went out. And the letter, again, coming from La Paz, Mexico, dated 25th, Mex 25th May, addressed to Mr. Grant, CEO of Port Authority, Re Ferry for Trinidad and Tobago. Again, I hope this letter finds you well, Mr. Grant. It has been brought to my attention from our marketing and business development, which is also in charge of our chartering, the need that you have for a ferry to operate between Port of Spain and Scarborough. Baja Ferries has the possibility to offer our MV Cabo Star with the following capacities. And it went on to list the specs of the Cabo Star. And in the case, the vessel is positioned in West Coast, Mexico, and could make Port of Spain 12 to 15 days after departing from its current trading area. The MV Cabo Star can be available shortly after we find an agreement. She can be inspected, in case you need, at your earliest convenience, and the vessel is trading between the port of Mazatlan and La Paz in northwest Mexico. We have been receiving requests from different brokers for our vessel, but we understand the importance of the situation and prefer to enter into discussions directly in case you are interested. I believe sometimes it is better to deal with matters of this nature directly, with no intermediaries, and if you should be interested in our vessel, my team and myself can pay you a visit shortly in order to discuss further. Should you have any questions or require additional information, please do not hesitate to contact me and any member of my team. I look forward to working together in the near future. Best regards, Oscar Ruano, Chief Executive Officer, Baja Ferries, Mexico. Mr. Chairman, when I, received, when I saw these documents, given what was in the public domain, in the media, and out of the media's work, I became very concerned. Because what occurred to me is that, is it that here is the owner of a vessel making the vessel available to the port, and the port not obtaining that vessel from the owner, but either allowing or taking steps to allow the vessel to be made available through a third party? And I take note of the fact that the letter points out that the owner is saying to the port, I prefer to deal directly with you. I summoned the chairman of the port the following morning and asked whether she was aware, either from the management or from the board or in any form, of any owner of the Cabo Star before Bridgman's. And the chairman indicated that in the dealings with the Cabo Star, there was never any other owner in front of the port's processes but Bridgman's. I asked her if she was aware of any correspondence coming to the port by way of member, staff, or otherwise from the owner pre-Bridgman. She said she was not aware of it. I then made these documents available to her. And she confirmed that these documents form no part of the processes that took place the at the board level. And she was unaware that the management was in this contact with any person who had an interest in the Cabo Star. 
I then asked her, or should I say, I then inquired from authorities what would have been the circumstances had the port been aware of this offer. The general consensus was that the port could have obtained this vessel from the owner at considerably lower cost. I made further inquiries that had the owners been the supplier of this vessel, the vessel could have been had by best, best market, best market practice and rates for approximately five or six thousand US dollars a day less than we're paying now. Mr. Chairman, I raise this and put this on the record because it is my view that this committee is doing a good job in ventilating certain things, a lot of it of great interest. But we would fail in our duty if we do not get to the very bottom of this issue to determine whether my worst fears are being realized. That the laxness and the defense of conflicts and encouragement of corruption on the port on this particular occasion, a, a knock on from the Galicia arrangement where a lawyer could come on the port and end up getting the contract to supply a boat that she selected and get involved in the selection process and put an agent into the evaluation process. And then, of course, would have us believe that once the agent got the job, she had none to do with it again. And the question that has to be asked is, when your agent got the job to supply the Galicia, where was your beneficial interest? Is it that you let the agent run away with the trophy? Or is it that the authorities under the Anti-Corruption Act needs to find out whether there were benefits being had by that subterfuge that took place with the Galicia? And the port would have allowed that to happen. Because when the evaluation took place and was told that your attorney who was hired to give you legal advice on the warrior spirit was invited to be a bidder, nobody asked a question, how come? And when your bidder produced another company in the form of an agent entering the evaluation process, and you allow that to happen, nobody asks, how come and why is this happening? And then you knew that is a vessel that was found by your agent, by your lawyer, and you allow that to happen. And today you have all kinds of people. Galicia, 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 defended the Galicia. I am telling you, Mr. Chairman, it is my view, which I'm entitled to under our constitution, that they're defending their personal interests. As a matter of fact, permit me to digress, Mr. Chairman. I know that there are difficulties. I know that the government that I lead is responsible for what happens. And all the responsibility, the government is responsible. But I tell you this, the defense of the Galicia, especially in Tobago, and the dissonance from Tobago had the effect of doing as much damage as the corrupt practice that put the Galicia in Tobago. There were some voices that spent every news, real, morning news, midday news, evening news, in defense of the Galicia telling the world how bad Tobago is. They went as far as to photograph empty shelves on the internet and put it in the paper that Tobago was running out of food. People in Tobago were starving because the boat wasn't coming. And of course, they have their hotels and their guest houses that they want people to occupy. But the news from Tobago and the voice from Tobago is all about how bad Tobago is. Oh God, we suffer, you know God, we go dead. Right? including fabricating situations to push that across, all behind, telling the government, just hire the Galicia, and all will be well. Look, we just had a destruction of the Northern Antilles, US Virgin Island, BVI, Barbuda, Anguilla, Puerto Rico. Not a voice from Tobago saying, Tobago is open for business. Our hotels are available, our airport is open, our streets are available, we have, no, no. The voices are only available when it's time to talk stupidness and to get up and defend wrongdoing. 
because they have no interest whatsoever in a procurement process that could stand scrutiny. The minister who I appointed and gave him specific instruction to go down into that den of iniquity and clean it up, he came to the parliament. And he was the first person to advise the country through the parliament what happened with the procurement process of the Galicia and the role played by Nari Alfonso, the, court, the port's lawyer. He was the first person to do that on my instruction to clean up the port. And I expected the pushback from the port because the port is a place of conflict and iniquity where the taxpayer gets the rough end of it. And of course, you want a head. You want the minister head. And if I had given you the minister head, all of us would have been happy. A minister head has been taken, but those who are down there benefiting from the corruption, which is the hallmark of that in other places in this country, would have been there waiting for the next government and the next board and the next government and the next board and what they have become accustomed to would survive. Mr. Chairman, I implore this committee to put an end to this. The same way this committee's convening is breaking new ground in this country, it will break new ground if it holds people accountable, not just by getting ahead, but by getting the individuals who have made a career of this. And I dare say, the port is not the only place in Trinidad and Tobago where this is going on. Understand? And Mr. Chairman, I have asked Mr. Mute to do a report. Knowing what I had known then, and what I found out after, and that report is to assist. Because what I have done, Today, I have sent the report to the parliament, and I trust that that report will be ongoing to this committee, and members would look at it. It's a compendium of the documents. Not he say, she say, the documents in support of what I have said here. And of course, I am also sending that report to the Attorney General's office for further attention. And I'm also going to make it public so that the public will read it and understand what has been happening with respect to public business. This would not be one of those situations where a report goes on the shelf and gathers dust. The public must know. Public must know. And when the public knows, they will take decisions in their own interest. Because there's too much self-interest. There's too much self-interest. I watch, I watch this committee's performance um, uh, <coughs> I watched this committee's proceedings today for a little while in between meetings. And just a little snippet I saw. There was one member before the committee telling the committee, in, very angry that we being, the committee was allowing wrong things to be said about it, and telling the committee that it was being said that the Galicia's cleaning service was $750,000, and it was not that. And the $750,000 was for two boats. And I said, this could not be accidental because it was repeated to the committee. I can tell you, as I joined this operation, the $750,000 was not for two boats. It was per boat. $750,000 per boat. And I saw a member engaging one of my colleagues here to convince my colleague that the colleague was wrong. And in fact, it's not just $750,000. In 2015, the contract to clean was $56 million. A $56 million contract awarded over a three-year period without tender on the doorstep of the election. And if these people figure we do not know how these things go, they're not fooling anybody. But I'm saying the time has come for this country to take stock of who benefits from the corrupt practices in this country and the conflict in this country and who suffers from it. A $56 million contract is not a small contract. And to come before a committee of parliament and tell the committee of parliament that the 750 a month per boat um, for, 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 for two boats is in fact trying to soften the revelation of the port's business which requires urgent attention. I once again want to use this opportunity before this committee as I'm one of your colleagues to apologize to the people of Tobago for what has happened and what they have gone through, but to also tell them that there comes a time 
when the doctor that administers the needle in the surgery is the savior. And the nurse that takes the, the, the knife and, or the scalpel and gashes the boil may have inflicted pain on the boil, but that is the precedent to the healing. My, my government has taken issue with the establishment on the port and will continue so to do. And nobody will get this government to do what they wanted us to do, to give them a quarter billion dollar contract without tender and get very angry when the cabinet decided in March to instruct the port to go out for tender, to decide, well, since all you're doing that, we pull in the boat. We will discuss that in another air-conditioned place with a different person, and not you in the chair, Mr. Chairman, a person probably with a gong and a wig, but that will be discussed elsewhere. I say no more for the moment, Mr. Chairman. I'm open to your questions if you have any. And the floor is open to questions. Senator Ma. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me once again um, welcome the Honorable Prime Minister. Um, Honorable Prime Minister, as Chairman of the Cabinet, are you aware that on December 15, 2015, the Secretary of the Port Authority, one Pamela Ford, wrote a letter to the Minister of Works and Transport Fitzgerald Hines, the Honorable, indicating that the new board of the port, which was only installed, I think was November the 22nd or thereabouts, don't hold me to it, but it was in November, that the new board at its first meeting had taken a decision to terminate the party charter agreement for the Galicia. And they were advising the Minister of Works and Transport to take steps or measures to provide notice to the owners of the Galicia, 90 days notice. Are you aware of such a letter? Mr. Chairman, I'm here in my capacity as head of the cabinet, and there's a route by which information comes to the cabinet. That information, if it had to get to me, had to get to me by way of the minister and the cabinet, and no such information got to me. OK. May I also ask um, the Honorable Prime Minister, are you aware of the Charter Party Agreement involving the Cabo Star and the Ocean Flower too? Are you aware of the Party Charter Agreement? I am not aware of the details, but I do know that if the port is going to enter into arrangements, Charter Party, the Ministry of Works, what happens with, with those vessels is that it is the Ministry of Works that is the client and the port uses the vessel obtained by the Ministry of Works, and I would expect that where charter parties are concerned, that um, the port would follow um, the arrangements to contract. You would know that, or you should be aware, that on the 17th of June, which was a Saturday, the party charter agreements for the two vessels, the Cabo Star and the Ocean Flower II, were signed by the Permanent Secretary, Deputy Acting at that time, as well as Mr. Brian Grange, or Grage, who was a lead person of this particular company called Bridgman Services Group. Given, given, all, given all that you put to me, I can't say I'm aware because I don't know what, is, what, um, what you are concerned about. I, I haven't heard the name Brian Grange, so I can't say yes, I know that. But what I do, say, do know, what I can say, is that in the attempt to bring the Tobago problem to acceptability as quickly as possible, as I said earlier in my presentation, I was on standby and available 
to expedite the process so that time being of the essence, that the port could move as quickly as possible. And once I was approached that my decision was required, I was prepared to give it, and I gave it on a weekend, a Friday afternoon. And once I gave that to ensure that time, valuable time, to shorten the suffering in Tobago, that he doesn't wait for another week of cabinet. Cabinet meets on a Thursday and confirms on the following Thursday. But once I, as Prime Minister, gave the authority to proceed, which was on, I'm, I'm advised that it was Friday the 16th, yes. then whatever else you're asking there would flow from that. What I'm asking is that would you not agree before you grant approval for anything in this instance to give the Ministry of Works and Transport the go ahead to sign off on the party charter agreement, you would conduct some due diligence? I, was, I, I am always advised in matters of this nature by persons whose job it is to advise me. And I would not give, even though I'm saying that I would give approval, it is I have to justify myself, to myself, that the approval is worthy of being given. And as a matter of fact, as a, as a matter of fact, when I gave the authority to go forward on the understanding that it will be ratified by the cabinet, it was because I was satisfied that the relevant authority advising me was on, was on board and that the documents going to the cabinet will have the relevant support for what I had done. Would you want and, to share? And, and, and it did have independent advice. Would you want to share with this committee who were your advisors and who was the independent counsel that would have advised you to approve this document ultimately? What, 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 did, what did, was that? 2016, Friday, 16. Mr. Chairman, if my memory serves me right, I was, I was either in Tobago or I was in Tobago. Okay, I was in Tobago and I was on the phone to my office, personnel of which were in touch with the Attorney General's office and the port was being advised and that advice was being transmitted to us. And if you want to know the name of the advisor, I'm advised, I, I didn't know then, I'm not, I'm not being told that the advisor was Joan Julian from the General and the Attorney General's office. So, so that aspect of it was well covered. So would you, would you not agree, Honorable Prime Minister, that before granting approval to the minister, through the ministry, to sign off on this party charter agreement, your or your the charter party agreement um, or contract, it would have been at least reasonable for the Honorable Prime Minister to be properly advised on the contents, because I'm leading to a question. Let me, let me, let me answer that. Mr. Chairman, these things don't go down from the top. They come up from below. So by the time it gets to me for my sign off, what you're raising there, this due diligence, would already have been satisfied at the level of the port because the way it goes, the management will advise the board because the, the technical people and the, the, the human resource is the work is done at the management. They will advise the board. The board, through the chairman, talks to the minister. And when the chairman talks to the minister, what you are raising there is work that would have been done. And one then understands that the minister doesn't go out and do his own due diligence because the chairman approaches him. And when the minister gets that clearance from the port by way of its board saying, we are in a position to proceed because we have this vessel and we've done what we had to do and we are satisfied that the vessel is available and we have independent legal advice that we can proceed in this way. By the time it gets to me as prime minister, that satisfaction is in place. It is not a requirement then for me to go and launch my own due diligence. I have to rely on the, the governance structure below me and I did so and I'll tell you that if what you are saying is that I should have delayed it to conduct my own investigation, I disagree with you, Mr. Chairman. Because I'm telling you, as head of the cabinet with responsibility for the condition of the people of Tobago, 
I had a responsibility to make time work for them. So I, standing on the work done by my minister, my board, and my management of the port, I take a decision resting on the work to be done in the structure beneath me and doing it so that time will work for the people of Tobago and not lose the vessel. Because if we had lost the vessel, we got to start all over again. This is the port's argument. This is the port's story. As a matter of fact, if my memory serves me right, the port had come to the, book, to the cabinet with some other vessel before, two vessels before. And before the cabinet could sign off on the approval, we lost the vessels. Because it was summertime. Right? Because the vessels were in great demand. And since we couldn't sign off, the minute they were available, or the day or so, two or three days later, when the port thought they had a vessel, they said, sorry, you're too late, the vessel is gone. When this third vessel appeared, right? And they come on a Friday afternoon and say, Minister, the minister comes and says, we, need, we can't wait until Thursday for cabinet. We need you. Because normally, the minister wouldn't come to me for sign off. A minister wouldn't come to me to sign off on something we're supposed to go to the cabinet on Thursday. That will happen only in an emergency. And we consider the Tobago situation an emergency in so far as choosing and finding a vessel to get there as quickly as possible. And that is the only reason why the minister found me in Tobago to tell me that they require my instructions. I didn't have a pen and paper to sign my name on anything. I said on the phone, proceed and it will be ratified by the cabinet. And then the cabinet note will have to be prepared and brought, and that was done. Well, we were told by the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Works and Transport mm -hmm. in evidence that uh, uh, independent legal counsel approved the party sure. chart or the charter party agreement. They also told us that the attorney general approved the Charter Party Agreement, and they also told us that you, as the Honorable Prime Minister, signed off on it. But we got documentation from the said Ministry of Works and Transport showing that the Party Charter Agreement, or the Charter Party Agreement, was signed off on the 17th. Which is the day after. No, the 17th. Is the day after. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't think the, this advisor um, the Honourable Please, let's be reminded has any that the witness yet, alone will speak. Except to speak in low tones to the witness, not to me. You are not here as a witness. Continue, Only Prime Minister. Member Mark, continue Mr. Chairman, my, my, my time, your time is valuable. Don't yes, spend, of don't course, spend of course. And I can control him. So, Mr. Mr. Continue Mr. with your Mr. question. I, I, I want to be very I, calm. I, 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 I want to be very calm. Control, like you. I'm going to ask your chairman to control you. Yes, thank you. Good. Thank um, you. Could you start over the question, please? No, I'm, 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 I'm asking Honorable Prime Minister that we have written documentation from the Ministry of Works indicating that the Charter Party Agreement was signed off on the 17th and the Cabinet note was approved on the 20th. No, what I'm saying is that this is what we have in black and white. But no, and that is why... But you way, have it in verbal from me too. Yeah, but what we are asking you now, because we asked the permanent secretary, would you be willing, because of the nature of this matter, and because as you have said, and I totally agree with you, you want to get to the bottom of this thing, and you want to deal with appropriate recommendations so that it will not reoccur in the future. Would you be willing to make available to this committee the various cabinet notes for purposes of our site? Yes, cabinet notes, because we have a document that is contradicting what you are saying. What the Honorable Prime Minister that is saying. Man. So can we get an approval? Let's go step by step. Yes. Let's go step by step. I was at length and at pains to point out that I gave agreement for the process to proceed by giving prime ministerial clearance and authority on Friday the 16th, Friday the 16th. It is only after I gave that, that somebody, anybody, anywhere would have proceeded, because I'll tell you, when I was contacted, it was told to me in the request being made to me 
that they need my sign off so that they could proceed to sign. So when I gave the approval on Friday evening about this, about this, about about this what time was it? Was it late? Eight. About 8 o'clock in the evening. It necessarily follows that any signing off would take place after that. So if you're telling me that the documents that you have show that the charter party was signed off after the 16th, which is the 17th, then that is fine. I am confirming that and I confirm the circumstances. And then if you tell me you see a cabinet note dated on the 20th, it meant that the action of signing the charter party was done on the strength of the prime ministerial approval, then subsequent to the signing of it on the 17th, a cabinet note would have been written, 17th is Friday, right? 17th is Saturday. We don't work on a Sunday. You come to work on a Monday, people start to type and prepare a cabinet note, which goes to cabinet on the Thursday, and if you're telling me it's the 20th, the cabinet is, then everything is as I have said. So I don't know what other document you're referring to. At this juncture, I would ask the member to move along, because in his opening submission, the witness stated what you just again put on the record, that he was approached before um, the cabinet meeting as an urgent matter to give his verbal or you know, advance approval on behalf of the cabinet. And he did the same. So I think we're going over old ground. So could you move along, member? But, Mr. Chairman, I crave your indulgence just to specify on the record that all of these actions that I've just outlined for the second time, the cabinet record will show that there was a ratification of this action. And under the Constitution, that is how it ought to be. There has been no breach of anything here. Yeah, but I think that was clear from your earlier submissions. Could you move Thank along, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, Honorable Prime Minister, I have a document before me dealing with the Charter Party Agreement. And there are certain blank spaces on this document. And I just wanted to ask you if you had sight of this document at all in Mr. your capacity Mr. Chairman, as Prime Minister. In my, in my outing here to assist this committee, I would not engage in any matter which I have no knowledge of. I am under, my understanding is that the minister responsible for the port was here. The chairman of the port was here, members of management of here, and if that question wasn't answered then, sorry, I can't help you with that. Could you elaborate on your st statement that the port is an area of conflict and inequity and corruption? Do you have any I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure that the record will show that I use the word inequity because I, do, I'm, I am not aware of the port being operated in any equitable arrangement. So I don't think I use that Iniquity. word. Iniquity. Iniquity. Yes, I'm a, a I beg your word. pardon. Iniquity. Iniquity. Meaning wrongdoing. Yes. Oh, yeah. But, but again, Mr. Chairman, given the fact that I am sitting here in my capacity as prime minister of the country, and my statements would have certain kinds of uh, interpretation, I want to limit my uh, characterization to what I've already said. I don't want to be, let the documents speak for themselves. And I've said I'll put the documents out for the public and let the public come to their own conclusion. I don't want to sit here and pontificate any further on my feelings or my uh, thoughts on the matter. I think I've gone far enough and I think I've gone further than uh, maybe I should have as Prime Minister. But the bottom line is I thought that I should go that far so that the public could understand the nature and the extent of the concern that exercised my mind. I have two questions just to tie up wrong one. We can't come into wrong two. And the two final questions would be, you had said publicly to the people of Tobago that because of the circumstances surrounding the Seabridge crisis, any future tendering for vessels to deal with the sea bridge would involve members of the stakeholder community 
of Tobago, including the specifications of the vessel in question. My information is that the stakeholders in Tobago have not been involved in a public advertisement that has been issued by the Port Authority that is supposed to close on the 20th. I would want to take your word for what it means. It is serious. And as you told Mark Bassan, your yes means a lot. So I would like to ask you, in light of the absence of stakeholder involvement in the actual tendering process, the drawing up of that tender, which is now publicly advertised and is scheduled to close on the 20th, would you not, Mr. Prime Minister, agree with me that the port has run afoul of your position and this tender ought to be cancelled and allow the stakeholders of Tobago to be involved in that whole process before it is publicly advertised? I just want to get your views on that. Mr. Chairman, I didn't want to interrupt my colleague, but maybe I should have if I had known that the question would have had such a tremendous length. Because had I interrupted him in the first paragraph, we could have saved some time. We noticed a moment ago I used the word inequity and how easily inequity became inequity with tremendous difference of meaning. The entire premise of your question is wrong because nowhere in the record of my presentation in Tobago will you see that I offered Tobagonians to take part in the tender arrangement. What I said is that when we put the evaluation team in place, we would want Tobago to have an involvement in the evaluation. And that was based on the fact that it was at the evaluation stage that some of the wrongdoing had gone on with respect to the Galicia. And we thought that the port, when they found vessels, when they had a basket of vessels to look at, we would allow Tobagonians to help to get involved in the evaluation of what has been offered to the country in that process. And that is still alive and well. My understanding is that the tender went out according to the specification approved by the cabinet. There are a number of vessels that have been offered by persons and agencies and so on, wider than ever before. And that now we are in a position to add to the port's evaluation team some Tobagonians and that will be done. So your concern is a bit premature and your accusation that I'm failing to have my uh, expectation or my commitment carried out, that is not based on what I said in Tobago. Everything is on track as per the commitment given. Um, Tobagonians, only yesterday I was advised that um, the evaluation team, the port will not expect that the, some Tobago to be added. Um, we will consult um, in Tobago and the minister will consult THA and the private sector in Tobago and add uh, maybe two more persons to the evaluation team. Because that is where the record will show that at least on one occasion we had mischief. And if Tobago, if we have 10 boats to look at, some boats are blue, some boats are green and to be going to decide which one they may or may not want and get involved in the process. That is what I offered. So a lot of what you said there was based on a misrepresentation of what was said in Tobago. Thank you for the correction. May I ask the final question? You had said in Tobago, when a question was put to you, that there was something crooked in this particular deal involving the Cabo Star and this ocean flower too. And your yes meant a lot when you were asked to further elaborate. Would you want to share with us what informed your thinking at that particular point in time as it relates to crookedness in this deal? Mr. Um, um, Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Chairman. I think, as Prime Minister, I've done enough. And I've taken steps to ensure that whatever elaboration should come, the documents will elaborate what ought to come. I am not to stay here and pontificate any further on this matter. 
I have made available a compendium of documents in the Muti report. I have made myself available. I have outlined what, I, what has come to my attention. And I think I have said enough to guide the process further. It will be a great tragedy indeed if after all of this we don't get to the point where we can identify what has happened, who is responsible, supported by the documentation. Because all of these things ultimately may end up in a court of law. So my pontification has no place any further. Member Dr. Lover Francis. Our uh, Prime Minister, good evening again. Three quick questions before I actually forget them. Um, we've had two weeks of testimony which says, which say that things have gone terribly, terribly awry at the port. Um, some of it frightening, almost all of it very disturbing. Could you outline at least the cliff notes of what kind of intervention might be made in the short term to alleviate? That's one. Um, where the passenger ferry is concerned, um, we've had testimony from the port officials stating that, as you've said, there's one um, ferry in the dry dock with a major overhaul. The other has continuing problems. The first one will not be back out before November, and that's a generous assessment. The other one could go down at any time. What is the prescription in the short term? And the third one is um, just for my curiosity. Why a single investigator to investigate the issue? Thank you. Let me, let me answer the second question first. The single investigator, if one had paid attention to the terms of reference, it was to examine the documentation of the processes that were involved in the procurement and maintenance. It generated a lot of um, commentary. All of it, I think, or most of it, not paying attention, but what was going to be done here is go down to the port, pull together the documentation, see what is there, read them, ask for what you need, get them, and present to the Prime Minister, and pass on to the Cabinet, this compendium of documents. It was clear that this was not going to be a, rec a report that was going to make recommendations and come to conclusions as to where for a lie, it was the documentation because these matters have to be dealt with by what the documents say and show as compared to what is being said in the public domain by interested parties, conflicted parties, and possibly corrupt parties. And that was the basis. And I thought that that could have been done by one competent individual. And I, I dare say it has been done. So that's that. The second question is, um, what sort of intervention? Well, the first intervention has already been made, which is to acknowledge that we are limping along on a service. Um, I saw it said the other day um, by an individual speaking from Tobago that Tobago is cut off from Trinidad and so on and so on. I, 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 I kind of live in Tobago sometimes. I get there as often as I could, so I, I have an idea what's happening there. It's not that Tobago is cut off. We have three vessels on a good day going to Tobago. A cargo vessel, uh, the, the express, and the, 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 the smaller water taxi. On a bad weather day when the water taxi can go, we'll have two going. And of course, if the express breaks down or is too long, it's not an ideal situation. And we want to get out of that situation as quickly as possible. To treat with that, we've gone out to tender again to get a ferry a passenger ferry. That process, the tender process ends, tenders close on the, in the next few days. And as soon as that tender is closed, we go into the evaluation stage. And I'm hoping, and we're all hoping, that in the package of offerings from those who have boats, and especially now that we're coming to the end of the summer season, where boats that are, would have been working elsewhere for the Northern Hemisphere summer, a lot of the time, a lot of these boats are engaged well before for the summer. And when you were going out in, in um, April and May, it was a bad time to be going out. Now is a much better time because you are heading towards winter, or fall and winter, where many of those vessels are now out of their summer program and should be available for charter in our waters. So we are hoping, we are expecting that we'll get more offerings and we can choose one that meets our needs. And we are keeping our fingers crossed that the express doesn't break down before that process is concluded. It should be another 
three weeks, two to three weeks to complete the process. Once that is done and we have on the service a proper passenger ferry, then the question of the um, dry docking of the Spirit and the Express will recede as a threat to Tobago's connectivity. We are, that, that would be the medium term because that contract would be a contract of two to three years. So for 36 months, we will have no problem with the ferry once we get a good one in the bargain. And then in the next few months, we are finalizing the um, specifications for the new ferry that the government intends to order. Um, we are looking at the process of ordering. You can, there are only two, um, there are two companies in the world, INCAT and Austal. Um, we are hoping to talk to our counterparts in Australia and so on and so on. So that, that's, that's being acted upon. The outcome, the long-term solution, which should take about um, three years, you, can, you, won't, you won't get a new vessel built and delivered under, under 24 to 30 months. It is our expectation that we'll have a new vessel built to our specification to replace the charters that we, um, as a matter of fact, given the fact that we are focusing on expanding Tobago's contribution and involvement in tourism, we may very well have to move beyond one ferry of the type that you're talking about. We may have to end up ordering two to be delivered over a period of time because Tobago's contribution to the national economy may demand more than one large one of those ferries. So we're going through a difficult period now, but we see the long term where we have at least two ferries operating. And I also did mention, um, um, member Mark mentioned what I said in Tobago about Tobago being involved in the evaluation process. We did mention that maybe um, the operations of this or similar ferries should have a greater involvement of the Scarb report as against relying entirely on the Port of Spain port because the, 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 the interest in the ferry coming and going is greater in Tobago and it may very well be that we should operate, right? have the top operation of the ferry from Scarborough. So these are discussions we're having. But the immediate thing is to get an adequate service, reliable, clean, and safe between Trinidad and Tobago. Right, so the port. For example, we heard testimony today, and there was a line of questioning which suggested that some of the practices that were discussed are normative everywhere. But I'm a student of history, and I know from history that wherever those practices are put in place, corruption, malfeasance, and misfeasance is normally the end result. So that's the one I'm most concerned with, the issues on the port. What kind of an intervention in the short term? That's a long answer. Could you give us some cliff notes on that? Well, I think the port, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, this is my winding up. If there are, if, I, I, I want to deal with that in the context of my winding up. I would like to ask you to make a, a winding up statement. So if there are other questions, I will take them now and I'll respond to that question in my winding up. Uh, so if there are other questions, I can does take the member agree to the format? Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Sorry, good afternoon. Um, good evening again, Honorable yes, Prime Minister. Um, just a couple of statements and one question. Um, as we've heard, repeatedly throughout this proceedings, this service is more essential to Tobago than it is to Trinidad. And I'm wondering, because in my experiences in my life, um, we have lived prior to being in Trinidad and Tobago, when something is called an essential service, it has certain policies that goes along with it. Uh, just as an example, uh, the TTC in Canada, which is in Toronto Transport Corporation, is deemed an essential service there. And with that, there are certain policies, meaning that the workers cannot strike because of exactly what would happen if they did. Um, and so that being said, is there a possibility, based on your vast experience in Parliament, to, when we say essential service for this particular service, to legislate uh, certain policies that would transcend governments and transcend boards? Um, in relation to that. So when we say essential service, there's a legislative solution that can be put in place so that it does not matter which board is there or which government is there, that the way we operate that service, it operates in a particular manner. Um, secondary to that, one of the things that is going to happen in the future 
is that there's going to be a port in Toko. And we are seeing here throughout this entire process where the actual process by which we acquire vessels um, coming from management straight up to cabinet, I'm wondering that when we put a port in Toko, if after we solve this problem, if that is going to be copied um, when we have this port in Toko. Because I'm sure for Tobagonians, one of their concerns is a port in Toko is going to be beneficial. We have two ports and essentially two bridges, and therefore a, a more robust service to Tobago. But if the problem in regards to maintenance, management, and tendering occurs at Port of Spain to Scarborough, and we copy that, then the same thing will happen with Port of Toko to Scarborough. So in other words, um, what assurances can be given to make sure that that doesn't happen when we beef up that service? Well, first thing, um, essential service in the legal sense has a meaning and is covered by law already. So if we get to the point of designating the ferry service an essential service, it automatically becomes covered by the existing legislation. Thirdly, secondly, um, I don't know that there's much that's happening on the port now that can be copied for the better. Right? In fact, it is the, it, the opposite is true. But designating an operation at uh, an essential service does not guarantee that the service would be there. You can designate the ferry service essential to Tobago. No argument with that if you get there. But if you get to the same situation where a boat breaks a contract or a boat breaks down, an engine breaks down, the designation of an of a essential service has no bearing on that. What you have to have is proper management and accountability of the asset, fit for purpose to deliver the outcome that you want. That's, that's the way you want. And where we, have, where we have fallen down, where we have fallen down is having the fit for purpose management, fit for purpose vessels, and fit for purpose service. And that has nothing to do with it being designated an essential service, if you get my drift. Um, witness, I, I think the member may have used the wrong term, because in our, our earlier deliberations, the issue of special tendering, or even soul select, um, came up so that the, the description probably should have been emergency as opposed to essential service because the issue came up that CTB, um, whether they would concede that the situation in Tobago amounted to an emergency, an emergency then allowing for different tendering arrangements that is normally prescribed in the ordinance. Chairman, I'm sure they would because I expect that the CTB would be populated by people who understand what's going on. And this situation um, would be, because it has been. The CDB was, in, the CTB was involved in this, and in what I described this afternoon, and did, fact, did in fact give its approval. Because if this is not an emergency, then I don't know what is. I mean, the breaking of that contract and giving us no notice and no time, if it was something that we could have gone down to Massey store and buy one or go to um, you know, whole, Southern Wholesale store and buy one, then of course. But getting a ferry vessel in a, um, to fill in a slot in a matter of days is not something that you can do. It, it, it automatically puts you in a situation where there's a disruption. And once there's a disruption with the kinds of consequences that Tobago was facing, I have no doubt that any central tenders board population management would see this as an emergency, and that is already covered by law, and in this situation, they did, in fact, cooperate to have that done. Member um, yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Prime Minister, um, given all that we have heard today, would you now say that there was a crisis situation on the port that required emergency? At the time when the Galicia left, it left and created a crisis, I must tell you, the threat of leaving was done in the full knowledge by the principals of that vessel that it will create that problem for the country. And the expectation was that the government facing that situation would have had no choice but to give without tender 
a contract for five years worth a quarter billion dollars. That is what we were facing, and that is what we decided was unacceptable from a procurement standpoint. And the government of Trinidad and Tobago is not going to be blackmailed by any service provider who sneak in through the back door as an agent in the first place and then has the unmitigated goal to come to another government and say, if I don't get five years to buy the boat, to be here for the rest of my life, I will disrupt the country. We took the position that the government understood that there was a contract in place being operated with about six months left in it because it was going from April, May, June, July, six months to go. And that was ample time for the tender process to have taken place. And the supplier had the ability or the opportunity to take part in the tender process. They took the position that they want no tendering on the port. And I tell you this, because the way the port has conducted its business, it has given license to people like that to determine that they will determine that there will be no tendering on the port. And I think we have gone out in this particular situation with that particular vessel, with those particular principles, six times? Was it five times? Five times. Under the last administration, at least three times, under this admin, the intention was there must be no and there will be no tendering for this contract. That is an untenable state of affairs. I'll tell you though, I, I think I apologized to Tobago early on since I came here. If I didn't, I want to do it again as head of the government to apologize to the people of Tobago for the inconveniences and the hurt they felt. But sometimes a country has to do what a country has to do. And in so far as the bread van didn't bring any bread to Tobago, I'm sorry about that. But I'm hoping that somebody takes the opportunity to build a bakery in Tobago so that Tobago could bake bread in Tobago. So when the bread van doesn't come, Tobago's economy right, is not damaged in that way. And I've grown up in Tobago where there were times after Hurricane Flora, we didn't have water. There was no drinking water in Tobago. And we survived on water being brought for us to drink. We knew then it was only for a short while. And tough times don't damage tough people. Tobagonians are tough people. And they will understand that no government in this country could take that blackmail from a service provider who is telling the government they need five years of contracting at $50 million a year without tender so as to continue providing a service to Tobago. And if there's any blame to be taken here, I, as head of the government, accept it as part of my duty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening once again, Prime Minister. Um, thank you again for coming. I, I think um, that this is a welcome precedence that you have set for future prime ministers of this country, and I would like to thank you for that. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, I, I listened to your opening statement, and I have a better understanding of what the Mote mandate was in terms of documentation. And I get the gist in your reading of that you became, not that you didn't have concerns before, but you were more concerned now than ever in terms of how we would have done business in the past, in terms of contracts and um, how we got to where we are. With that in mind, Prime Minister, looking at, and I'm sure you may have some of the same documents that we have, knowing that we are leaving this perceived bunch of madness that happened with reference to the Galicia and so on, based on the assessments that would have been provided to you. Going forward, knowing your government's stand on corruption and procurement and so on, one would have thought that attention should have been paid to the nitty gritty going forward as we got on to the, the procurement of the four vessels to where we are today. And, and what I want to get at, Prime Minister, is we have documents which showed 
that charter party agreements for both vessels, the Cabo Star and the Ocean Flower too, critical pieces of documentation, information was missing, which goes against normal practice. And it's not any piece of information, Prime Minister. It was specific information as to the account holders, banking information, who gets the money. Information as to the agents, their accounts, where is the funds going? Now, I agree with you that you, you sit at the top of cabinet, you have experts who are advising you, you have people who are vetting these documents, and I don't expect you to run down every piece of document to view it. But with that in mind, knowing that those documents, those critical contracts have missing information, only today, in a, doc, uh, a package presented to us, uh, we demanded at the last sitting that the Port Authority provide us with copies of the Charter Party, party Agreements for the Atlantic Provider and the Trinity Transporter, because none was presented before. At that point in time, we were of the, the, the opinion that none was done. Today, two documents turns up in the package, Prime Minister. And would you believe it is not signed by the public servants. It has the, the owner's signature, but no signatures there. And then, Prime Minister, becoming aware of some of the proceedings over the last two weeks, taking note that Bridgman had very little financial data. The Dun and Bradstreet report were extremely damning in terms of how solid this company is. Now, Prime Minister, what I want to get at is how did we miss that? How did we get from this whole presumption about the Galicia having, you know, riddled with all kind of inefficiencies, and yet under a minister appointed by your administration? A Port Authority board appointed by your administration. Are you disappointed that these are gross inefficiencies or, 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 or gaps in the bridge that should have been filled coming out of what you now said that your documents have revealed concerning the Galicia? Are you disappointed that that is part of our proceedings? knowing what, 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 what you said about your government's stance on procurement and corruption, Prime Minister. Well, let me, I, I can't take issue with much of what you have said, colleague, except to say that, you know, hindsight is, 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 is great vision. Remember that the board of which that criticism might be directed found itself in a situation where the bridge between Trinidad and Tobago had broken down. And the next step was to have a bridge put in place. The board took urgent steps. This is a new board, eh? This board came in um, April. April. Remember the, 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 the ferries broke down soon after the, car, the cargo vessel left. So, so this, is about, this is April going into May. So here it was. We're facing a situation where the board has, is on tenterhooks with respect to the ferry bridge, not the, not the cargo, I'm talking about ferry here now, right? The, 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 I'm a passenger. The board firstly dealt with the cargo by getting the best of what was available around, right? The, 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 the barge they talk about today and the transporter, the documentation for that would have been done in an environment where there was nothing to take cargo to Tobago. So the board had to, I mean, it was a beggar not choosing what is available, whatever was available. The, it, at one point, I must tell you, we got as far as discussing using the, the Coast Guard supply vessel. It was as serious as that, to take the supply vessel out of the Coast Guard because you, we couldn't countenance having a situation where there was no traffic between Trinidad and Tobago that could take light, light cargo. So the documents you, you have show, you've seen today, I have not seen those documents because I rely at the level of the, the, the cabinet on 
the structures below to do things like that. I don't know, I can't speak to those documents, and I'm sure because of the nature of this committee, you would have spoken to the people who would, who would have handled those things, and I'm sure they could explain themselves. However, the situation was one that required urgency. Get to Bridgman. When the port went out to tender, I was happy. In fact, let me back up a bit to answer your question whether I'm happy how. I'm not happy the way things turned out. I thought the process would have worked. We go out to tender, we find a boat, a cargo boat, we hire it, problem solved. We find a, fer a, a passenger ferry, we hire it, problem solved. I am unhappy that that didn't happen for reasons known and given. However, I still am of the view that we could shorten and let this be behind us by just putting the vessels in place to do the work that's supposed to be done. But when the port went out for tender, which is the process that you expected to follow, and the tender process threw up one vessel, which was wholly unsuitable according to their analysis, because that is their job to analyze it and see if it is OK. So they went from tendering, one vessel was turned up. So tender process number five would have failed. The board could not say, well, sorry, Trinidad and Tobago. There's no boat to be had because the tender process threw up one boat and the boat ended good. The port now was done in emergency mode, dealing with looking for vessels that were not part of the tender process. Unsolicited vessels now became available to be considered by the port. Whether that was accidental or deliberate or just happenstance, but the, that is what it was. So when the, when, when the bridge man, whoever bridge man is, whoever bridge man is, or bridge lady, said, we have a vessel here which you could use, it is reasonable to assume that the focus there would not be who are you, but what are you offering me? Focus on the what and not the who. And had the press not gone in depth or the who, the what might have been satisfactory, and the what might have succeeded. But the port at that time was focusing on the what, because the port was out there in the world looking for a vessel to fill a need where there was an emergency. And they focused on the what and not the who. I am told, and the documents I've seen, they got the Lloyd's clearance on the cargo vessel, and that is a reasonable assumption to be made that if it's on the Lloyd registry and it's available and on inspection, my team says that it is suitable, then I think you're solving a problem in a crisis. And that is what happened. It may not fit every description, but that is what happened. Prime Minister, if I may just ask one, one additional question. And it, it, it comes back out. Um, from the conversations that came out of Tobago. And um, when we sat in Tobago last week, the common trend was that for whatever would have caused the Galicia to be the vessel on the bridge, whether it, it was corrupt practices or not. You did, vessels, you're dealing with the cargo ferry. So, yes, the cargo ferry. And not referring to the passenger ferry. That's correct, with Galicia. Mm -hmm. If the, the fact that the operational component of the arrangement was servicing Tobago well, this is from what they said, right? Because in retrospect, when we ask about the Cabo Star, the issues that came up on the Galicia, which was cost, the size of the draft of the vessel, those two areas, it was not solved with the Cabo Star. And the people of Tobago maintains the view that the government really should have done a bit more in exhausting all other possibilities you know, vis-a-vis, -vis go back to the drawing board. Other possibilities with which vessel? With, with respect to the Galicia, holding on to it, in the interim, based on the critical nature of the situation, 
knowing that there were no other vessels on the horizon, and perhaps we've already committed so much to it, perhaps it may have made sense, listen, let's hold on for a couple months again until we get to the point where we would not have to rush as we clearly did with the ocean flower. Because up to now, that vessel hasn't arrived here as yet. And it, to my understanding from the documents that were provided, contracts were signed for this vessel, charter party agreements were signed for this vessel, and an inspection, a physical inspection for this vessel was not done at, it, at its home port. It was only done in Panama here when the vessel traveled halfway around the world. And those things are not normal, Prime Minister, in the world of the maritime industry. So my, 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 my point is, is that, you know, perhaps, as you said, in hindsight, perhaps it may have been, according to the, the people in Tobago, that a little, a little more due care could have been done in terms of trying to hold on as long as we could to the existing vessel before we, 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 we ran straight into, into what we ended up with the Cabo Star. Chairman, let me go over again, because I think maybe my colleague missed the gist of what I said when I opened this presentation. And I implore you to read all the documents in the Moutier report and whatever other documents you may have. What I said earlier on is not a question of that the port could have hold on so as not to create this crisis. The documentation will show that the interest that provided the Galicia had a condition which they could not discharge. And they went to the minister and said, listen, the Galicia is only available until February. If you want it beyond February, you have to give me a five-year contract to buy it. And the simple question to the population is, should we have done that? That is what the document says. And to say, to say that we didn't give ourselves time is not correct. Because the government was contracted to have the Galicia until October. It was only when the supplier of the Galicia decided to pursue this five-year contract without interest in the 18-month contract that a crisis occurred when the Galicia was pulled by the principals and left the government without a vessel in April when, in fact, that said vessel was contracted to be there until October. And the principals were telling the government, for us to continue beyond, remember Good Friday? They were pulling the vessel on Good Friday. And then there was an uproar, and they kept it. They got a little, I think it was a two-week addition. Mm -hmm. For us to continue making the vessel available, in other words, I have to buy the vessel. And to buy the vessel, without tender, you have to give me five years of contracting at $50 million a year. Those were conditions that we could not accept. Prime Minister, I, I hear what you say, but that is not the information that we have in, in our bundles. Well, I don't know what information right. you have. And, and, the information and, I have is what I just told you. Well, okay, so if I could just share, I won't be too long again, sir. The owners of the Galicia, there is the view that there is in existence an 18 month charter party agreement, a contract, where it is of the view of the Ministry of Works and Transport that there was an offer and acceptance and that constitutes a contract. But Prime Minister, this is not a taxi where you jump in a taxi and say, look, I'm paying $6 to go to San Fernando and when I reach, I'm bound by contract to pay. In the maritime industry, there is no contract without a BIMCO agreement. And, and I'm speaking specifically from what in the correspondence between um, Mr. Powell and the, the, the ministry and the Port Authority was that, where is this contract that you've referred to? We have been patient, we are waiting for it, and nothing is happening. And in one of the, the letters, they referred that, listen, in the industry, because it's such a close-knit industry, 
They are saying, well, look, the government is going out looking for vessels all over the place, and the owners are saying, where is our contract? If we don't have a charter party agreement, well, then something is wrong. So I, I'm just putting forward, Prime Minister, that, you know, there may be a deeper-seated reason, rather than just out of pure, pure victimization of the people of this country, that the Galicia was moved, because of that breakdown in the relationship going forward between the owners with all, and, and, and with the With all ministry. due respect, colleague, we are now entering into the realms of speculation. And I would not accompany you there. Okay. And I would leave the legal interpretation of the law of contract to the legal advisors to the government, two of whom are senior counsels, and have advised the government that there was a contract in place. And had it not been so, when the contract was broken in April by the leaving of the Galicia, the Galicia principles sought to insert a substitute vessel. I don't think that is the action of a person who didn't have a contract and thought that they were just walking away from business that was had. So you see, let us not get beyond ourselves and confine ourselves to the document and leave the law to the lawyers. Thank, thank you, Prime Minister. <clears throat> Yeah, Prime Minister, want, let me once again thank you and congratulate you for... I thought you were inviting me to make my final submission. No, no, no. You're not, you're not the chairman, have, right? No, I'm not the chairman. I'm the chairman of another organization. Um, just to add a little humor to the, to the settings here, because you, you, you mentioned um, you couldn't go to Southern Wholesale store and buy a ferry. But if the ferry was made out of good wood, you, you probably have gotten one. <laughs> Um, seriously, um, in your intro introductory remarks, you, you dealt at length with the procurement of the Superfast Galicia and the role that Nairi Alfonso played in the whole procurement process and by extension the role of Intercontinental. I just want to go on records to say that um, this committee has been very much seized of that matter and we did in fact grill Ms. Nairine Alfonso extensively in that regard, and I'm sure what came out of those um, questioning will form a significant part of this committee's report. Let me, let me say this, mm -hmm. Permit me. I raise that not to belabor the point, mm -hmm. but to shift the conversation to what could happen at the port mm -hmm. and what happened at the port and what is happening at the port. That is why I raised it in that element of uh, effort of clarity. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I don't put that on record. Just uh, that you should know, earlier today in our meeting, closed meeting, um, we read into our own record a letter written to the Ministry of Labor. Um, and in that letter, representations were made on behalf of the Seamen and Waterfront Workers' Trade Union with regard to an ongoing grievance with a subsidiary of that company. And um, the author of that letter was the legal representative of, or the person who contended to be the legal representative the Seamen and Waterfront Workers' Trade Union. And the letter was signed by one N.D. Alfonso. So I just think that that should be entered into the record, given the subject we are on. Um, and just to let the public know, and, and, and the chairman will announce it shortly, but I think I'm linking the two points, is that we received correspondence today from Mr. Powell of Intercontinental that he will not be appearing in, um, before the, this inquiry, and I want to express my regrets on that matter. And finally, sir, the, um, again, I want to thank you for making the MUTE documentation and report available to this committee. And um, we had Mr. Leon Grant and other members of the ports management before us. At that point in time, we were not aware of the, the correspondence from Baja Ferries out of Mexico 
in that regard. So I, I guess we will want to probably ask him to reappear to account for, for what we will see in the documentations that you have provided and any other matter that um, we, we, we see fit to so do. But I, I just want to say I think this inquiry is going well and I think it is setting a new precedent to the nation. Mark. I won't detain you much longer, sir. Honorable Prime Minister, we were advised by correspondence and minutes of the Board of Commissioners meeting dated February the 4th, 2017, that the seven-member board headed by Christine Sahadio approved a document submitted by the management of the port recommending a three plus one plus one contract for the Galicia, which was written, which was a, well, the board didn't approve the minutes because the chairman resigned on the 22nd. But in the minutes that we have before us of that meeting on the 4th of February, it wasn't a correspondence that dropped out of the sky. It was a decision of the board led by Christine Sahadio and the six other commissioners to, and they agreed to the three plus one plus one. And on that basis, one of the technocrats at the port wrote to Minister Sinanan the decision of the board. So I just wanted to let you know what we have been provided in writing as opposed to what you have said and others. So I just thought, because we have documentation that would contradict a lot of your submission. And there's where, at the end of the day, we will have to probably call you back for clarification. But this is just a statement. But I want to ask you whether that report that you have made available to Parliament, because of the serious nature of that report, would you be sending that to the police, to the Director of Public Prosecutions, and to the Integrity Commission? And the reason why I'm saying this, we are talking about public monies. And if a name that you mentioned today is involved in activities contrary to the public interest, it warrants a criminal investigation. And therefore, I'm asking you, apart from referring that document to the Attorney General, whether it is your intention as Prime Minister, because of the serious nature of the allegations made, whether you'll be referring that to the police, the DPP, and the Integrity Commission. Mr. Chairman, I'm very studied in the statements I make and the actions I take. And if I've said that I would send it to the Attorney General's office and send it to the Parliament to form part of this discussion, part of this inquiry, it is my understanding that this effort that this committee is making will use its authority to summon persons and papers and drill down into these issues. And I trust that when you do make your findings, rather than contradict me, you will make your findings based on the evidence. Because I'll tell you one thing, Chairman, the, the, the soundbite of what has just been said by my colleague, Member Mark, that he has documentation to contradict a lot of what I have said. Sounds good. 
And I couldn't prevent that from being said. But the bottom line is this. I also have documents to support what I have said. And if he is relying on the fact that the management of the port took a position which was advanced to the board, which was advanced to the minister, and that the cabinet should have acted with it, all I will say to him today, it would not have been the first time that a board would have, that a management would have misled a board, a board misled a minister, and a minister misled the cabinet, because it is the same management that supported the removal of bay ferries from the passenger ferries and pass that position up through the board to the cabinet. And the cabinet rigorously resisted agreeing with it, asking questions to which we got answers. Answers turned out to have no merit. And the next thing we know, the cabinet agreed to go along with it. And a bad situation was made worse. In the interest of whom, we don't really know but it wasn't in the interest of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So your absolute belief in what the management passed on to the minister is not shared at this time by me. Well, it's not belief, sir. I'm just dealing with facts. And you know, as Grant Grind said in Charles Dickens, hard times, facts are very stubborn things. So I would proceed by asking. If you want to discuss Dickens, <laughs> We okay, could spend we, a few hours doing we, that. We will spend some time. I just wanted to ask you, Honorable Prime Minister, um, procurement, as you are here, I know that you had given commitments, and I know the Minister of Finance had also given a commitment. By March of 2017, the procurement legislation would have been operationalized, because I believe the problems that we are confronting now the source of it lies in the absence of procurement legislation. I just want to ask you whether what action you intend to take as Prime Minister to operationalize procurement legislation to avoid the debacle that we are now facing as a nation that you have described earlier in your contribution. Let me, I have two answers to give you. One is that yes, I did say in the parliament in session that we are taking steps and we set March as the deadline. What has happened is that what we found that when we try to mobilize the public service to receive the procurement legislation, the public service was not prepared. They were, they were not ready because what the law calls for are procurement units in every procuring department. And to just uh, proclaim the law and let loose that law on a public service that was not ready to do that would have created chaos. So, so we spent some time preparing the public service. The first cut on that March deadline, after all the preparations, when the public service came to us, what, we did, what they did was to expand the public service by creating a new department called procurement, requiring hiring procurement staff in every department of the government in Trinidad and Tobago. That was an unacceptable arrangement. We had to go back to the drawing board and retool the public service thinking that what you do is designate people within the system as procurement officers, and only where you don't have enough bodies or qualified bodies, you then hire into. And we, we think we fixed that now. And we are ready to proclaim, but we can't proclaim until the direct, what is called? The regulator is in place. And that regulator is appointed by His Excellency the President. His Excellency the, Pre His Excellency the President has gone out, the advertisement has been put in place, he's sourcing that person. And we in the cabinet, we are waiting for as soon as the appointment of a regulator, we will then be in a position to proclaim the procurement legislation. So that's where we are. So even though I had said March, because of these difficulties that I just mentioned, we are ready now to go as soon as a procurement regulator is appointed. The second point I want to make is this. 
this procurement legislation, and I'm speaking here now for myself from the top. I was in the, um, the committee, as you know. Um, I served on the committee. I voted to bring it into law and so on. I don't want anybody in this country to believe, as is being advanced by some people, that the existence of procurement legislation is a panacea for corruption in Trinidad and Tobago. What it will do is to legislate how government business should be conducted. And if persons run afoul of those statutes and regulations, then they can be held accountable against those uh, components of the law. But persons who set out to be corrupt and to twist the things in their favor to bring about the corrupt practice, some may be deterred by the existence of the law because the law now criminalizes that action, like, for example, bid rigging. Bid rigging is not now um, is not a, an, a criminal offense. But in that law, it will become an offense. And then public servants will have to cooperate and do certain things in a particular way. And if they don't do it, then you can say, here it is, you've done this wrong. So it will help. But it is not a panacea because I, draw, I, I hold out to all of you and the national community. There's a book on corruption in Kenya, I think it is, written by a woman called Michaela Rung. I think the name of the book is Your Turn to Eat or My Turn to Eat, something like that. You know, you know the text? That book is an object lesson in how corruption is operationalized in a country that is inherently corrupt. It starts with conceiving the project that you might not even need. It starts with costing the project, sourcing the money, sharing information that should be kept secret, allowing contractors to have ideas. The law wouldn't prevent people from trying to use that to get the advantage. It is vigilance and enforcement of the law that will give us a chance under the new law. And what, what the new law does, eh? while it brings the benefits that we expect it to bring, it also brings some potential challenges. Because before, you had a central tenders board at one time, and all the country's procurement went to a central tenders board. I have no doubt that there might have been instances of wrongdoing, but it wasn't the, the, the wash and the rush. Then we grew a public sector, state enterprise sector, and a lot of government procurement was being spent away from a central tenders board arrangement. And then, of course, we suddenly had a lot of money to spend, like at the port, where a lot of money is being spent, as I said earlier on. These are all opportunities to, to have greed prevail. And of course, now that the procurement legislation will put a procurement unit in every single department, heaven forbid that it doesn't multiply the possibilities for corrupt practice rather than solving it. And that is my concern. Two final questions. Um, Honor Honorable Prime Minister, um, would you not agree with me that it is highly irregular for a government and its agencies to sign off on a party charter agreement charter party. or a charter party agreement without having sight of the vessels that they are going to actually hire on behalf of the people involving, I mean to say, millions of the citizens' hard-earned tax dollars? Would you not agree with me that is a highly irregular situation? And we were told by Mr. Purdy, who was here, that they had an agreement that once they won the tender, they have an agreement that they would just want to search for the vessel. That is what he put here in evidence. I don't know that I could I don't know that I could assist the committee on that particular question. And I'm sure that there are other people who ought to have been able to do that. Because you see, as I said early on, if the circumstances warranted that kind of action, where you had two vessels and you lost them because you didn't move 
with alacrity. And you, on the third occasion, you did that to ensure that you were locked into the vessel and not lose it. And this is 2017, this is not 1917. Right? It is possible to inspect a vessel thoroughly without going to the port and seeing it in today's world, you know. And of course, if you rely on an examination by the authorities that sign off on vessels, then I think it's a reasonable arrangement. I think I read in documents where the port had Lloyd's and other ex um, expressions of concern. And on the, somebody raised a question that I didn't address, and I think I must address it, that you didn't, you signed a charter party, and you didn't inspect the vessel until so and so. A vessel is leaving Korea, coming to Trinidad and Tobago. The charter party, I think, would have said that you accept it on arrival. Now, if a vessel is going to sail halfway around the world, do you want to have it certified in Korea and it travel around the world and it breaks down and it mash down and then it comes to Trinidad and Tobago? Yes. Or do you want them to bring it from Korea to Panama and you enter into an arrangement to inspect it in Panama? So whatever happened between Korea and Panama is for your account. And the condition that we're going to take the vessel from you is when it passed an inspection in Panama and not in Seoul in Korea. Isn't that reasonable? And that is what happened. You found a vessel located in Korea. And under the circumstances, even though you, were, even though you urgently wanted a vessel, you said, you bring your vessel eh? all the way around, get it to Alaska, get it down, get it to Panama. We will send our people to inspect it and see what condition it is in in Panama. The ocean floor was inspected in Panama. It was found not to be satisfactory. And what did the port do? The port terminated its contractual arrangement. And what that tells you is that whatever arrangement you are taking issue with in this charter party, the port was able to terminate it because the vessel in Panama didn't meet the port's condition. And I think that's reasonable. If the, if the ocean flower, too, was to sail into the port of Port of Spain, Honorable Prime Minister, in the next couple of weeks, what would be the government's position on this matter? Mr. Chairman, the best of my knowledge, the port authorities that handled this matter had terminated this vessel for cause, and I'm not in a position to address that question. I think the port had made it quite clear that we have terminated our arrangements, and um, uh, I say no more for the moment. I have one final question. You have a number of final questions. <laughs> I have one final question. And if you, could, if you could probably clear the air for this committee, it has been brought to our attention, as you brought into question this sole investigator, Christian Muti. It has been brought to our attention that this same Mr. Christian Muti was planning to take legal action against the state because his company called Agostini was owed some $140 million by the government of the Republic of TNT. And it has been brought to our attention that that money, because he was threatening legal action, was eventually paid by the government of TNT. Now, all this would have taken place before he was appointed sole investigator. Would you want to clarify, deny, dismiss this matter that has been brought to our attention because <clears throat> we need to clear this matter. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have absolutely no knowledge of what my colleague has just raised. Absolutely none whatsoever. I know of no such development. I know of no such claim. I know of no such payment. When I asked Mr. Mutier to do this assignment, it was purely in my selection of a member of the business community and I virtually had to twist his arm to get him to undertake the assignment. I know of his competence and his efficiency, and I also know that the complaint from Tobago, why I chose Mr. Muta, one of the reasons I chose him, other his competence, was that the complaint coming from Tobago was largely coming from the business community, who were every day complaining how business was being affected by the port's conduct or misconduct of his business. And therefore, to ask a former head of the Chamber of Commerce of Trinidad and Tobago to go down to the port and report back as to what is going on there, I thought that was a reasonable action. I know nothing of which the member speaks. 
thank him for being and here. I, and I want to thank him, and I want to say, I want to say that while we're in a free country and free to say what we want about anybody, when we take the kinds of positions of fab, you know, fabricating conspiracies and demonizing members of the public who get involved in public business, all we end up doing is ensuring that people of quality stay very far from public business. Because I cannot for the life of me understand where this came from, where someone is simply going to go down to the port in their own time, using their own time pro bono, to do what he has done. And instead of getting thanks, which I will give now to him, I thank Mr. Mute for undertaking this very thankless job and to have done a very effective job in putting together a compendium of the documents that were made available to him to him at the port, which I can now make to the public and to the parliament. I think he did a good job, and I think he's a citizen in whom we are all proud. And I don't think, when this kind of thing happens, that it do us any good in advancing our own agendas, whatever they might be, to demonize people who decide to volunteer in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, something I'd like to draw to your attention and get your response to. Um, both the previous Port Authority um, board and the current appeared before us. And in the case of the former board, um, they admitted, and it was obvious, uh, even at this point in time, when they're out of office, that they never got beyond the um, storming stage. You know, the management concept of forming, storming, and norming. Um, it was obvious that they hadn't advanced beyond that, and that um, whatever minister had oversight over them was unable to take them through that phase with the speed at which it was necessary. What um, I observed of the replacement board is that when asked whether they had a strategic plan when asked whether they had a business plan, the answer was no. So I found that in both cases, um, the kind of governance that one expects, the kinds of um, norms and philosophies that govern modern management, um, well, was just absent. And I wondered whether this had been brought to your attention before. Chairman, in all fairness to the, the board that is there now, that is led by a very distinguished former permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance, a person in whom I have tremendous confidence, um, they came in at a time when they were operating like a fire brigade. They came in in April of 2017 when this kind of development attracted all of the attention. So they've been there for four months now. Mm -hmm. So one can understand why they could tell you that we have not come up with a strategic plan reflecting their arrival as a new board in a very difficult situation. The port is not an easy place. There are established norms in there. There are serious conflicts. There are management factions. I mean, when I got reports of how certain even seating arrangements were working out at the port, I understand that the new board had a serious challenge. And even before they could deal with the challenge, we had this situation. I have every confidence that once we put a passenger ferry system in place that is acceptable, a cargo ferry system in place that's effect, um, acceptable, then this board will be able to sit down and now take part in what has to be done, which is treating with the chronic unacceptabilities at the port and I say all along that today I'm Prime Minister, I lead a government, we take responsibility for what has gone on there in our tenure and what is going on there now. But I have confidence that we're going to address it. And that is why I have confidence and I'm hoping that my confidence is not misplaced, that this inquiry will not go with preconceived notions about, um, you know, who was in conspiracy with who and who get um, contract paid and that. look at what is in front of you, the evidence, and assist in rectifying one of many areas 
in this country where this kind of environment exists and is pretty much being deemed to be the norm in Trinidad and Tobago. I hope that we're turning a corner here with this inquiry and with this intention of this government to hold people accountable where they are located. I now invite you to make your, or you wanted okay. you I now much. invite you to make your closing comments. Thank you very much, Chairman. Chairman, I just want to say that the state of the port at Port of Spain ought not to be news to any citizen. There's a lot happening there which makes the news from time to time. And some of it has far-reaching consequences beyond the ferry. The ferry issue has brought us to where we are now. And out of this evil should come some good. Because, you see, the port of Port of Spain, if one looks at where things have been going right, going wrong, you would find that what we're dealing with now didn't start yesterday, but we can't allow it to continue. There's another, and there's another issue on the port where there are serious issues with the cranes that could put us not with a ferry bridge being broken, but the inability of the port to take vessels, take cargo off vessel, and that will create another kind of crisis. But then you will see that procurement, which were questionable, resulted in the port now paying for 25 trucks, tractor trucks, at a million dollars a piece. And that was done without cabinet approval. You hear a lot today about 16th versus 17th and a prime, minister, a prime ministerial approval. But the port is in the process now of buying 25 tractor trucks at a time when the port's business is contracting into oblivion. But the port is contracted to buy 25 trucks at a million dollars a piece. And I think they got five already. And the question is, should you be buying 25 tractor trucks in a contract, or should you be maintaining the cranes? But somebody got a nice business in the tractor truck business. But the cranes, the money to maintain the crane is committed to tractor trucks. So what we dealt with earlier on with the ferries is only a part of the overall problem. And of course, I heard the union this morning, and I mean, a lot was said this morning, and the public will come to their own conclusion there. But the bottom line is, the port of Port of Spain is in great danger because it is being obliterated by business that used to come to Port of Spain that should be coming to Port of Spain. It's now going to Jamaica. It's now going to Santo Domingo. And Port of Spain is being deemed irrelevant for a number of reasons, not the least of which what we're dealing with here in terms of the unacceptability of conflicts and corruption on the port. But its efficiencies, if we don't intervene and look at the competition which is driving us out of business. Of course, we're going to have to have a port to give us entry into Trinidad and Tobago. But we have Point Leases, we have other ports. But the port of Port of Spain is losing its premier status in this part of the geographical location in the world. And Jamaica has gone past us. And, of course, Santo Domingo. And if we don't do something to earn back that space, we will be made irrelevant. A handful of people could be prospering on the current arrangement, but the port of Port of Spain for the people of Trinidad and Tobago is spinning off into oblivion, and we have to intervene there, and that is why the government has to intervene in this way. And of course, you have the whole question of the, you know, the, the Panamax cargo. The port of Port of Spain has done nothing. We as a people have done nothing to prepare ourselves to be a part of that. The Chinese are moving around the world, building these all-purpose all ports. If they grow in Jamaica or if they grow in Santo Domingo, what is our question? We have to get serious about our business. And therefore, where it is clear a drunken man on a galloping horse could see that there are serious problems at the port, problems that are of management, of maybe weak board because it's a state board, of a cabinet that could be misled by the port and the board and the management, none of those put us in a good position. And I hope that we come out of this, come out of this, 
better off and better able to address one of the challenges of this country, which is whither goes the port of Port of Spain, where hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent and we're getting less and less economic strength and regional and international competitiveness for it. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. The witness is excused, and I thank you for your time and effort this afternoon. Um, this hearing is suspended for 15 minutes.